episode of Words That Kill, and today my guest is Judith Moffat, who's a fantasy and sci-fi writer, and we're going to be discussing emotional ramifications on the story, and of course, we're killing characters, so I'm going to turn it over to her and let her introduce herself. Take it away. Hi, I'm Judy Moffat. I write fantasy and science fiction, and... One of the things I'm most interested in writing about is aftermath, and aftermath involves, as you might expect, having killed some characters first. So there tend to be a lot of um, character deaths in my novels. <laughs> yeah, well, we like that on this show, so... <laughs> so um, we'll ask the, the, the first question I usually ask guests, is that when you're crafting a killer, how do you go about it? What types of motivations do you use? Um, do they stem from personal experiences or consequences of something that happened to them? Okay, let's take an example. I have a killer who was a mass murderer. And he was a military officer who his belief, as, as is true of a lot of people, throughout time in the military was that his job was to take orders and that's what he did he took orders they installed a weapon of mass destruction on his spaceship and he went out and he followed his orders and he blew up a whole planet which was difficult for him to accept once he had done it because you know, he was just following orders, but then millions of people died. Yeah, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of emotional ramifications with that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if, if you want to talk about what happened to him afterwards, the first time that we meet the character, we, we meet him in a different context where he's just being a regular Navy ship captain and interacting with a trade ship and, you know, just behaving like a normal asshole. The next time we meet him is after he's blown up the planet. And now he's got a ship full of people who are all in shock, who are hating themselves for what they've done, who are committing suicide right and left, who can't sleep, who are just, including him, he's, he can't sleep, he's, he doesn't know what to do, he, he all he knows is he's got this weapon on his ship and he doesn't know what to do because they're going to ask him to use it again. From what you've seen before, he's not the kind of guy who's really terribly emotionally in touch with himself. And so this the whole ramification of this hits him like an anvil fell on his chest because it never occurred to him that he could have consequences for following orders. And then he gets orders that the fleet is going to go to this other planet and he's going to use the weapon again. And now he's conflicted. He doesn't know what to do. He can't follow that order again. He can't do it again. He knows that his ship is going to mutiny if he does it again, actually. So he calls his executive officer in and he says, we have to, when we flip over into folded space, which is where they travel faster than light we have to leave the fleet and go defect to our enemies and tell them give them this weapon so that they can figure out a way to defend against it and so that's what he ends up doing and he's sure absolutely positive that when he deflects defects to the enemies who in this particular case he's defecting to an alien government because they're closer than the human government that he would that they're fighting and but they're an ally and and he's sure absolutely positive they're going to kill him and give him the death sentence for what he did and that he's sure he deserves it and so they get there and the aliens being alien don't do death sentences and what they end up doing is giving him and his crew a whole planet for them to work out their own redemption. 
Oh, that's cool. He ends up helping other planets against pirates later on after the war. And he ends up as a priest with no personal name because he's given up his right to be who he was. And as the priest, he has a completely different management style. He's a completely changed person. So it's a really, it's, it's an incredible redemption arc that goes over basically three books. With the military setting and the, and the overtones in your writing, um, do you approach the events that you wrote with a clinical attitude or did you um, come at it with an emotional intent in mind? Oh, I always come at them with an emotional intent in mind. I, I grew up seeing the results of war. My father was a doctor at a VA hospital and we lived on the VA grounds. And all of these, you know, not just the patients who were missing limbs or had burns, but, you know, patients who lived there permanently because they were World War II veterans who had what they then called battle fatigue, uh, which we would now call PTSD, and they couldn't live out in the regular world. And the, these poor people, these poor men, they, they wandered all over the hospital grounds and you know, we interact as children, we interacted with them a lot because they were never going to have families of their own and they were never going to live a normal life. And they were thrilled to see the, the kids that lived on the hospital grounds. So it's been the emotional impact of what the military does and what happens in a war has been something I've been familiar with since I was seven years old. And then later on, I worked for the military as a, as a civilian. But I've known people who were in prisoner of war camps. I've known people who were uh, lost arms. The, the, almost all of the parents, almost all of the fathers of my generation served in either World War II or Korea or both. And so there were a lot of them who had emotional damage and physical damage. and that was just the milieu I grew up in. Well, it, it sounds like you have a lot of uh, built-in research for, <laughs> for your writing. <laughs> Very much. So um, when you're crafting a death scene, um, how do you go about it? What kind of research are you doing and your methods? And, and so what's your process? Well, Like you said, I have a lot of built-in research. I'm, I'm retired, and I've spent a good portion of my life reading about and trying to understand human psychology and how people react to things. I also have spent a good portion of my life as someone who's been affected by events. I've, I've been... I had an abusive father. I've been raped. I've lost my job. My boyfriend of 26 years died in 2008. So a lot of things have happened to me that tell me about the emotional impact. And because I talk about those things with people, I found the emotional impact that other people have had with events that have happened to them. They'll tell me things they've never tell, told anybody else. Um, like I have a high school friend who, when I started talking about being raped and the effects of that, was like, and we were in our late 50s at the time, and she was like, I never told anybody, but I was raped, and I got pregnant. I was 15, and my parents forced me to marry my rapist. Ooh. And then she had the baby, and the baby died. And she's never talked about it in her whole life. And that's one of those reactions that, you know, you understand that people hide this stuff and they hold it inside and they screw up their lives because they've held it inside. Secrets are, are toxic. Mm. And, of course, you have to write about that to some extent. And when you write, if you want to be realistic on them, even events that are bad that they weren't necessarily involved in, and the example I'll give you is 911. You know, 
I wasn't in New York City or at the Pentagon that day, but it still affected me. It affected everybody in the country and perhaps most of the people in the world. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's, it's the same way with the uh, Swiss air crash that happened here in Nova Scotia. I mean, I wasn't anywhere near it, but you watch it on the television and you and it's right there and off off the coast of your province. It's it has an impact, an emotional impact on people. And as people have talked, you see that the emotional impact that people had to those events was different depending mm -hmm. on the people. You know, I have a former co-worker whose husband was killed in 911. Clearly the emotional impact on her was much different than me. You know, I knew people who had friends or relatives that were in one of those buildings. And my sister went to Virginia Tech, which, as you know, had a mass shooting. Mm. And one of her co-workers' son was at Virginia Tech at the time and was one of the people who was wounded but not killed. And 10 years later, he's still not over that. Some people have the let's fix it response. And some people have the I'm not ever going to do anything to hurt anyone the same way I was hurt response. And some people have the I was hurt, so I don't give a fuck. I'm going to hurt somebody else in return because that's the way the world is response. And you have to show a lot of those different kinds of things in your writing. Yeah. So, um, what were the consequences of some of the of the event that you wrote about in your book? Well, I talked about the one guy and his consequences, or the consequences that turned out to be unlike what he expected. But let's talk about another guy. Um. He was in, he was a fighter pilot in space. Um, and he was in love with another woman who was a fighter pilot. Well, if you've done any research at all into war, you've done any reading at all into war, you know that fighter pilots are among the highest casualties. Um, you don't survive very long as a fighter pilot, and she didn't. And, in fact, she sacrificed herself. And then he's involved in this war, and he doesn't have time to grieve. And he just has to go from battle to battle, and he has to compartmentalize away from this. But that grief is still there. And six years later, he still hasn't had a chance to feel that grief, and he basically ends up drowning himself in the bottle and ends up coming to duty drunk and getting tossed out in the military. Because eventually, you have to feel those feelings. And so, it doesn't always happen right away, but eventually, those feelings are going to insist on being heard. And, you know, and, and adding the stress of battle after battle after battle over a period of years, you know, he just finally just broke down and couldn't do it anymore. And he was a fairly senior officer by this point. Yeah, that's a bit of a reflection of real life in a lot of cases as well. So it's it's good writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's when you're writing about aftermath, you have to think of all the ways that aftermath is, might affect you. Um, and they're not all just, you know, so much of what I see in the entertainment industry right now is let's have the big giant battle or whatever scene that's at the end of the movie or book or whatever. And thousands of people die and nobody gives a shit. That's not true. Even if you don't react right away, you do give a shit unless you're a sociopath. Most human beings are affected by death around them. And that's one of the things that I want to see in my writing is to show that it hurt. 
it hurt when people died. It affected their actions. It made them different people. You also have alien culture in, in your book. So how did their reactions differ and how did the the, the terrorist event, the, the planet killing event, affect them? Okay. There's there's two different alien cultures that we explore in the trilogy. And one of them I've talked about a little bit about how they reacted when the people came to tell them, hey, you know, we have the, the planet killer weapon and here you have it and what are you going to do with us? Um, the other reaction that changed the culture was really interesting was the one group of aliens, the, the, the Libyans, are very rules-based, very strict, very formal, very always do things correctly. As you could imagine, they don't have a lot of crime. They, however, did have some people who were xenophobic. And when the humans come there to try to get them to become allies, one of those people fell into a mental illness of not being able to tolerate that and blew up the human ship that happened to have somebody on board it. And the alien reaction to that was shame. Deep, utter, total shame. There are another alien culture that doesn't do the death penalty. They don't have jails. Um, what they ended up doing was personality reprogramming on the person. But what happened was the person who died was a young man who was a, he was a bit of a flake. And he was an engineer. And he liked to dye his hair bright colors. Um, and they did the, their equivalent of a funeral ceremony, which was what they call a ceremony of life where people describe the person's life and an artist, because they're a very artistic culture, builds a picture of their life as the people talk. And the Delevians are mostly into very pastel colors and very curvilinear things. Because he was an engineer, it his sculpture ended up being very different from anything that they normally did and it was involved into something completely different that no one had ever seen before. And then because they were so ashamed, they couldn't figure out what they wanted to do as a culture to make restitution. And so they, of course, replaced the ship because that's the easy part, right? Mm. But they couldn't figure out what they wanted to do about Ian's death. And what they decided to do was make him basically an icon of their culture. Someone they taught children about from the time they were old enough to hear. And so the children started to grow up with a different perspective on things than the adults had had. So that was a way that their culture changed. That ends up over the course of several decades where they suddenly realized that you know, they've been exiling anybody who couldn't fit in. Well, one of my characters on the ship is one of the exiles, and he lives on this human ship. And that it was wrong to throw them out because they didn't understand how to fit in the pattern. Because the pattern is very important to the Delibians. And so they decide to, to bring the exiles back. And to start teaching things that have more creativity to them and more... Uh, less pattern based. So it's very it it's it's very interesting. That that particular culture is also a culture that had been long term affected by the fact that they had a, in their very distant past been enslaved and physically changed by another group of aliens. And the physical changes were still there but they defeated the other aliens and it was a long time ago but it affects their culture. And this is where it's really starting to heal some of that, finally, after a thousand years, that they don't have to be what this other alien culture made them into. 
Interesting. Sort of a parallel of, of some actual real world events that are going on at the moment too. So. Yeah, well, I'm having a little trouble with parallel of real world events in writing. Um, when I was writing that first death scene where Ian is blown up, I'm writing away and I'm hearing my Dan and I got the TV on and CNN is babbling in the background. And I hear the words Virginia Beach, which is where I live. And I look up and there is a mass killing happening in the city I'm in as I'm writing about a terrorist attack. That was weird. <laughs> and then I go on and I'm writing the next book. And that is done. And then I go to the third book and I'm writing the third book and I'm writing about this terrorist attack. A lot of terrorist attacks in these books, what can I say? It's about a war in the aftermath of a war. Um, where the queen is blown up. And I look up at the TV. And it was January 6th, 2021. So you can imagine what I saw. I'm writing about a terrorist attack as the United States Capitol is being attacked. So I think probably I shouldn't write about terrorist attacks anymore. <laughs> At least not while watching the TV. <laughs> At least not while watching TV, that's right. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll just go into a couple of fun questions now and, and, and wrap the interview up. So um, what's the oddest thing you've ever researched and related to, to a character death? My current books, which are not mostly about death, Although there's a few in there because it just seems to happen. I, I had to do a lot of research into how British royalty works. Yeah, is, that's interesting. Really, you know, yeah, because some of it's really strange. And, you know, and it, and it changes over time. And my world, which is a fantasy world, isn't an exact duplicate of England. Mm. So I could make some changes. To, and then that's, that's part of it is looking at. Okay, you got to know what it is so that you can make deliberate changes. And so I did. I, I, I went down a, a real um, deep well, how they're, they're named and what the servants wear. And <laughs> that's from my book about the butts. My two books, really. It's a duology about a butler and a duchess. Yeah. <laughs> but mostly... A lot of my research is really done just by living and what I've observed in life and being a student of the world and reading extensively just to read. So I already know a lot of what I want to write about before I start to write it because I've been reading about, you know, like I've read, and this is going to show up in a book pretty soon, I think, uh, a book about trees and about how their root systems communicate you know so once you have those ideas in your head they become things that you want to write about and then you go back to the source material and say oh, okay now i remember i read about this now let me go get some more pull some more details and then you start to pull those things in i'm not a big i'm going to research this stuff for this particular book person i'm more of a I'm just going to read everything I can as broadly as I can, as often as I can, and whatever becomes useful becomes useful. <laughs> okay. So, do any of your characters have, or killers, have any favorite weapons? Or anything well, you favor to write about? I thought about that, and I thought, as I look on it, apparently my favorite weapon to write about is a bomb. <laughs> I blow things up. <laughs> whether I'm blowing up a ship in space, whether I'm blowing up something on the ground in a terrorist attack, I blow things up. Yeah. Um, other than that, uh, the other favorite weapon is magic. 
in the fantasies. Um, my book, The Butler, has this magical system where the servants have household magic and the nobles have high magic, which is supposed to be the bigger, better, more wonderful magic, but isn't. And because they're being attacked by other nobles, they only have the household people to defend them. And so then they get into all these crazy ways of using their household magic to affect the battle. The um, lady's maid, who uses her magic normally to like fit the clothing perfectly, uses her clothing magic to take out the threads that are holding the enemy's uniforms together. And suddenly they're fighting naked. <laughs> so that, that's an example of how I use magic as a weapon. And, and uh, this household magic in particular, you know, like the maids that work in the kitchen, the kitchen maids are used to heating up things with magic. So they heat up the ground underneath people. Um, the horse mages are used to controlling horses and they learn to use that to control people in the same way, like they're a herd of horses. And so they take these people who are attacking them and they herd them away. So it's very, it's, it's very weird use of, of weaponry. Oh, sounds cool though. Yeah, well, that one's not published yet, but it, I'm working on it. The duology is written. I'm just editing right now. Yeah, well, something to look forward to. So, Anyway, so I think we'll wrap it up here, and I'd like to thank you for being our guest. It was a very interesting chat. All right, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. You, you, uh, you had very interesting questions. Oh, thank you. And uh, so that's this uh, episode of Words That Kill, and be sure to join us for the next one. And that's all for now. Bye.